coup d'etat and social media. Forget the radio station, get the Twitter feeds. The United Cyber Caliphate and the competing peace brigades release overlapping and competing target lists. Hacktivism in Eastern Europe likes neither Russia nor NATO. Delilah is a backdoor Trojan built for blackmail. Wildfire ransomware looks like the work of the Russian mob. Some purported databases for prominent sale in the dark web look like junk. And of course, Pokemon Go looks like the biggest mania since the 17th century's tulip craze. Time to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, NetSparker. Still scanning with labor-intensive tools that generate more false positives than real alerts? Let NetSparker show you how you can save time and money and improve security with their automated solution. How many sites do you visit and therefore scan that are password protected? With most other security products, you've got to record a login macro, but not with NetSparker. Just specify the username, the password, and the URL of the login page, and the scanner will figure out everything else. Visit NetSparker.com to learn more. And if you'd like to try it for yourself, you can do that too. Go to NetSparker.com slash CyberWire for a free 30-day fully functional trial version of NetSparker Desktop. Scan your websites and let NetSparker show you how easy they make it. That's netsparker.com slash cyberwire. And we thank NetSparker for sponsoring our show. I'm Dave Bittner in Baltimore with your CyberWire summary for Monday, July 18th, 2016. Turkey's President Erdogan seems firmly in the saddle as his government puts down an apparent coup d'etat over the weekend. A purge of both the judiciary and security forces is in progress. Those who are said to have attempted to depose the president are said to have seized some mass communication media, but they either overlooked or were unable to cope with Twitter. The entire incident was tracked by tweets, which is ironic at best given the Erdogan administration's ambivalence about social media and its periodic efforts to rein them in. The government's use of Twitter seems to have significantly contributed to the president's ability to prevail over the attempt. We'll be watching for hacktivist or state-sponsored operations in response to the coup. For now, however, such activity seems limited. Terbium Labs has told us that they observed signs of one Turkish group breaching and exposing a Russian government database over the weekend, which they view as in line with long-standing Turkish efforts to push back against both Islamist and Russian influence insofar as such affects regional stability. ISIS names more people in the U.S. and elsewhere as targets, marking them by name as crusaders and encouraging the caliphate's followers to strike them. The announcement was made online by the United Cyber Caliphate, ISIS's nominal cyberspace arm. Iraqi Shiite leader Motada al-Sadar, whose peace brigades have fought the prominently Sunni forces of ISIS, has also announced some new and perhaps unexpected targeting. He advises that he will consider U.S. forces deploying to the region to fight ISIS targets. These statements, widely disseminated online, coming as they do after recent terror attacks, leads analysts to wrestle with the difficulty of distinguishing terrorists from people who are, as the New York Times calls them, simply deranged. Some think terrorist is used tendentiously and too expansively, but others argue that, given ISIS and similar groups' calculated appeal to the disaffected, the unsuccessful and unstable, a distinction without a difference. In other nationalist hacktivism, a Ukrainian nationalist faction, anti-Russian but not happy about NATO either, claims responsibility for a cyber attack on Poland's defense ministry. Diskin Advanced Technologies reports on Delilah, a backdoor Trojan criminals are using to infect and blackmail employees who visit adult or gaming sites. It collects information about the employees' dodgy surfing, then recruits the victims to steal and report corporate information. Failure to comply results in exposure. The insider threat comprises one aspect of cyber risk. There was much discussion last week at Cynet's Innovation Summit of Risk Management. Today we'll hear from Deloitte's Emily Mossberg, who talked us through her firm's latest report on cyber risk, Beneath the Surface. She told us that many conversations about cyber risk were only seeing part of the picture. There was a lot of dialogue focused on how do you quantify um, a breach of personally identifiable information and a lot of focus on the notification and customer protection mechanisms following a breach of personally identifiable information. But we knew through working with our base of clients that there really were a number of broader impacts that they were experiencing that really didn't 
seem to be part of the current equation. The report organizes potential impacts from a cyber breach into two main categories, above the surface and below the surface, and uses a metaphor of an iceberg to illustrate the concept. Above the surface risks include things like the technical investigation, public relations, regulatory compliance, and attorney's fees. But it's the below the surface factors that Mossberg says aren't getting the attention they deserve things that were not typically talked about. And that included things like the the value of lost intellectual property. Not that um, a breach of intellectual property is never contemplated, but we hadn't seen a real value or calculation related to what that might mean to an organization. Things like loss of contract value, as well as lost customer relationships. Then we have things like operational disruption and destruction. Again, most of the conversation around breach and incidents revolves around a breach of information. There hasn't been as much focus on what are the true costs if part of the business is unable to function or there is a true disruption of service. The report makes the case that while the the above-the-surface risks get the most attention, it's actually the the below-the-surface ones that can be the most costly. 90% or greater of the total impact ends up being beneath the surface. And and so what, what that really compels organizations to do is to, one, think about this problem a little bit differently than they've been thinking about it before, and look to additional mitigation strategies as it relates to how they secure the assets, how they monitor those assets, and how they plan to respond when they actually have an an incident. Mossberg says she hopes the report spurs conversations among stakeholders. How do we start to change the way that we talk about this and think about this to align more with a broader enterprise risk management strategy so that we're doing scenario planning around cyber risk similar to the way in which we're doing scenario planning for broader enterprise risk management? That's Emily Mossberg from Deloitte. The report is titled, Beneath the Surface of a Cyber Attack. And a program note, you can hear more from Emily Mossberg and other experts in our upcoming special edition, Quantifying Cyber Risk, which will be published July 19th. Ransomware continues its romp through corporate networks. Cisco Open DNS researchers have uncovered a new variant, they're calling it Wildfire, that appears on internal evidence to be the work of Russian organized crime. Several vendors are working on answers to the ransomware threat. We heard at Cynet's Innovation Summit that big customers are also big integrators of security products, often trying to pull together dozens of different solutions. Later on this podcast, we'll hear from Quintessence Labs' John Lisabor, who talk us through the interoperability challenges this situation presents. Even as new threats appear, old malware variants still comprise the dominant forms of malicious code and circulation. Configure still holds its lead by a comfortable margin, with Sality trailing in second place. Relative newcomer mobile malware Hummingbird has risen into third place, at least as Checkpoint sees the leaderboard. More files purporting to be stolen databases are for sale on the dark web, but some of them are more sizzle than steak, or if you prefer, more hat than cattle. A widely reported Amazon Kindle credential database being hawked in one of the black markets, for example, struck many at the time of its discovery as largely bogus, and we've received some confirmation today from Terbium Labs that those suspicions are well-founded. To them, it looks like junk, mostly, a bot database. The back traces, they said, are from something running in Azure and running a Selenium crawler, presumably to download free Kindle books. Pokemon Go now amounts to both a cyber-physical security phenomenon and the latest chapter in the history of the madness of crowds. The game is wildly popular, and if the videos we're seeing of self-organized mobs of Pokemon trainers surging through public parks is any indication, it's at least as popular among adults as it is among children. One such herd was observed stampeding after Vaporeon. This struck our technical editor as surprising, given that you can evolve Vaporeon on your own. We hasten to reassure the suits that our technical editor heard this from someone else, we think, not that he's like playing Pokemon on company time or anything like that. And there's plenty of other Pokemon Go news you can use, not the least of which are the emergence of a large number of malicious and bogus Pokemon Go apps that will snare the unwary. So download with caution. And please do watch where you're going as you pursue the Pokemon. 
Joint Base Lewis McCord, for example, near Seattle, has asked trainers not to chase Pokemon into sensitive areas of the base. You're welcome, General Lanza. Some people, however, we encourage to follow where the Pokemon lead, especially if you're in Manchester, New Hampshire, where the police department has helpfully notified a number of wanted felons that a Charizard, a freaking Charizard, has been spotted inside their main station. Go get them, Granite State's most wanted. And Manchester PD, catch them all. Time to tell you about our sponsor, E8 Security. The old perimeter approach to security no longer protects against today's rapidly shifting cyber threats. You've got to address the threats to your network once they're in your networks. E8 Security Behavioral Intelligence Platform enables you to do just that. Its self-learning security analytics give you early warning when your critical resources are being targeted. The E8 Security Platform automatically prioritizes alerts based on risks and lets your security team uncover hidden attack patterns. To detect, hunt, and respond, you need a clear view of the real risks in your business environment. That's what E8 gives you. Visit e8security.com slash DHR and download their free white paper and learn more. E8, transforming security operations. And we thank E8 for sponsoring our show. And I'm joined once again by John Lisabar. He's the CTO at Quintessence Labs, one of our academic and research partners. John, I know one of the concepts you wanted to share with our listeners was interoperability. What can you tell us about that? Sure. So uh, interoperability permits the exchange of information between components of a system. So, for example, the ability to exchange emails, the ability to display an image on a television screen, the ability to use the global positioning system, your car navigation system you know, to help you drive to a new destination. So it's all about making it um, possible to use different vendors' equipment to allow for the exchange or the display or the reproduction of information in a way that we'd expect it to all work transparently. Um, interoperability amongst different vendors' products really empowers users to deploy components in a system with some degree of confidence that they'll work together and they work together properly. It provides users with choice. Uh, it enables diversity in system deployment, which is extremely important for reliability, availability, and for security. Without diversity, a uh, single vulnerability could allow, for example, a breach of many different systems. It allows the effort required by an attacker to be much lower, uh, it, but it also increases the likelihood of a successful attack. So interoperability is all about protecting us from single points of failure. So when we're talking about cybersecurity uh, in particular, what are some of the challenges that we face when it comes to interoperability? Some of the challenges with uh, interoperability when we're talking about cybersecurity systems relate to ensuring that um, the algorithms we use, the data formats being used, the protocols for exchanging information, that they not only permit that exchange of information freely amongst the different systems, but that they also do it in a secure fashion. You know, there, there are many ways of exchanging information, um, some of which are, are more secure and some of which are less secure. So one of the real challenges is, is finding the appropriate interoperability standards that uh, are implemented correctly as well. All right, John Lisabor, thanks for sharing the information. We'll talk again soon. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, along with interviews, our glossary, and more, visit thecyberwire.com. Thanks to all of our sponsors who make the CyberWire possible. If you'd like to place your product, service, or solution in front of people who want it, you'll find few better places to do that than the CyberWire. Visit thecyberwire.com slash sponsors and find out how to sponsor our podcast or daily news brief. The CyberWire podcast is produced by Pratt Street Media. Our editor is John Petrick. Our social media editor is Jennifer Iben. And our technical editor is Chris Russell. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.